Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, February 22nd. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris here with you. Resuming our team preview series. We're halfway through 15 team previews in the books. 15 more to go. And today the focus will be on the top, the projected top of the AL Central. We'll have some Twins breakdowns, Guardians, and Tigers as well. And we have a few news items we're going to get to before we dig into those. Also, a quick reminder, we're going to put an updated link for the Discord invite in the show description for today. I think the old one expired. We just do that from time to time to make sure that stays fresh. So new link will come out with this episode. So apologies if you had some trouble joining that in the last 24 hours or so. On the news front, you know, a tough day for the Mets. Kodai Singa has been revealed to have a moderate strain in the back of his right shoulder. He'll begin the season on the IL, according to David Stearns. So, just how much are you dropping Sanga based on this early spring training news? I am dropping him all the way down to the 90s in my rankings, I believe. Um, starting the season on AL, it's just it, it, there's so many leagues where that is problematic. In a 10 team league, if you don't have many IL slots, why? Why do it? You just need to have pitchers pitching in a draft and hold. You're going to take a guy who's injured now. Um, that seems like a bad deal because, you know, you'd rather like there's going to be plenty of times when you have so many injured pitchers, you you know, you can't fill the lineup. So you can't you can't draft a lot of guys who are injured right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I think the use case for him is is maybe similar to Kyle Bradish, but Kyle Bradish, at least they haven't said you know, he's starting on the IL. They just said that he has a partial tear. You know, saying that he's going to start on the IL means I would put him behind Cal Bradish, you know, even if I was going to maybe take a shot at him. And lastly, you know, one thing that is interesting about this to me is that uh, we had some some healthy seasons from uh, Kodai Senga coming into uh, the, the Mets. Um, but we also, you know... In 2021, he only had 111 innings in Japan. He had 148 in 2022 and 166 last year. Um, it speaks a little bit to the difficulty of projecting injuries and also projecting innings. And uh, just there was a small little note uh, from Sky Kalkman where he just looked at uh, how you know how trustworthy are the innings horses and he said like okay of the guys who've had 200 innings or you know 180 plus over the last three years what we we can expect of them going forward well 30 innings less uh, as a group of the guys who've done 150 innings you know 160 he did this over and over again and every group was almost like 30 innings less so, you know, we talked this a lot about like, you know, Marcus Simeon, like 700 plate appearances every year until he doesn't, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's a little bit worse with pitchers where you're like, oh, but he's done like Logan Webb horse. Well, you'd, you'd actually expect from Logan Webb 180 innings next year. And that does still make him a horse, <laughs> right? but it's just always, it's always less, you know? Um, and so unfortunately it's just a part of the trend in baseball and i i i feel i feel badly for what i think also specifically this this injury is worse than cow radishes too uh because it's anything to the capsule uh if it ends up being surgery is an awful surgery so you're just hoping rest and rehab figures this one out yeah i think the state of the mets for 2024 which we'll discuss more on their team preview probably in the next week or so that also lends itself to them being extra careful. I mean, it's also a guy they've got on a long-term contract. Like all, all these factors are, are in play when you're trying to decide how to rest and rehab something like this. That opens the door for Tyler McGill or Joey Lucchese to possibly open the year in the back of the rotation. They got a couple of young guys that are interesting too, Mike Vassell and Christian Scott that we're probably going to see at some point in 2024. But we'll dig into that a bit more on the Mets preview once we have a little more information about how they feel about those internal options. Uh, we did see uh, an extension from the Pirates to Mitch Keller, a five-year extension for Keller one day after Steven Nesbitt and Ken Rosenthal <laughs> had a, a pretty scathing piece on the state of the Pirates organization, including the thriftiness of owner Bob Nutting. <laughs> In my mind, something like this plays out where Bob Nutting gets word of the story, sends the the front office a text. Hey, extend somebody. 
And the front office says, <laughs> I really like Mitch Keller. And they make the decision to extend someone they like. Um, Keller did take a nice step forward last year. It wasn't as big as we'd hoped. When you look at the first half, what he was doing then and how the season actually ended for him. But it was progress nonetheless for Keller. So uh, what do you make of this extension? And you know, what do you think 2024 might bring for him, given some of the adjustments we saw from Keller a year ago? Yeah, interestingly, uh, you know, you think of him as a power pitcher. You know, he does throw 95. Um, he has a big old sweeper that's good. Um, but, uh, when he's at his best, he's a, uh, like a five pitch pitcher. He's a, he's a wide arsenal pitcher. And what you saw near the end of the season last year is that he became kind of, uh, a hard pitch pitcher where, uh, he was throwing his fastball and uh, cutter and sinker, um, a lot and not throwing his other pitches a lot. So I'd like him to go back to throwing the curveball 15% of the time, throwing the slider 20% of the time, um, and being more of a true uh, five-pitch pitcher uh, rather than the kind of the three-pitch pitcher he ended up being last year in the second half. Because in the second half, he had like a 5-6 ERA and undid a lot of the good he did in the first half. Um, it's a little bit weird to be a wide arsenal guy without good command, though. I mean, that's kind of, he's somewhere, he's, it, it is really hard to figure him out because you, if you want to put him in the power pitcher bin, then you want him to just blow people away. But the shapes on his fastball aren't that great. And he doesn't just blow people away. Strikeout rates prove that, you know, and if you want to put him in the wide arsenal, Chris Bassett type bin, I mean, he doesn't have that command. Mm. So uh, he's, he's kind of, his, he's forging his own path, but I do think, you know, throwing all of his pitches more often is, is part of that future. I think the skill that we did see kind of held up over the course of the whole season was the improved control, right? He wasn't hurting himself with walks the way he did in the past. So I think that bodes well for the floor being a little higher with Mitch Keller. But yeah, like as a as a known tinkerer who picked up Velo, it still looks like he's trying to find an identity with the new things he's tried to work into the fold. It just it didn't all click, but there were some signs that what we saw last year was actually real, despite some of those those struggles in the second half. I'm looking at the other news item here and, and wondering uh, what's going on with this veteran shortstop market. Tim Anderson signs with the Marlins, gets a one-year, $5 million deal, and this comes after Ahmed Rosario gets one and one and a half from the Rays to basically be a small side platoon infielder that may play more depending on what happens at their shortstop position. You know, Anderson is like an extreme by lowest sort of player coming off of a miserable year, just one homer in 524 plate appearances. Uh, I think he had all kinds of problems. He wasn't pulling the ball in the air, wasn't even hitting the ball in the air that much. A 61.1% ground ball rate was even worse than what we've seen from him over the course of his big league career. But we've seen him do it with this approach. We've seen 2020 skills with a good average, and with that good average, a good OBP, so I think this makes a lot of sense for the Marlins, given the state of their middle infield. I'm just curious if we think with health, Tim Anderson can get back to something closer to those pre-2023 levels. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that he's projected to be like kind of a one and a one half win player. And there's been a pretty big debate about the linearity of war. So um, you're basically saying, uh, of dollars per war. So the idea is that for every win above replacement you produce, there's some value on the open market. And early on, we thought that that was pretty linear. You pay uh, eight, eight and a half, nine million dollars per win uh, for from a free agent, um, you know, no matter how good they are, or how bad they are. But what we're seeing with the Ahmed Rosario and Tim Anderson picks, and I think we're seeing increasingly, is that these players that are projected for one, one and a half wins, basically not average, two wins is average, that these players are not bringing back the same amount on the open market. Another example is Ahmed Rosario. But in fact, I think there's examples of this every year. And I've seen research uh, from Joe Sheehan and Dan Zimborski and my own that doesn't quite nail it and say, like, this is definitively a thing, um, but suggests that that dollars per win is not linear and you're willing to pay more dollars per win on the upper end for. And it makes sense if you think about a roster 
you're gonna you you want to have a, a a seven million dollar guy a seven win guy in one slot or seven one win guys like well yeah the roster slot problem is some of that right it's, that's yeah. an extreme example of course but I, I think it's it's being able to find and develop one and one and a half yeah. win players on your own and doing that for the league minimum compared to five million dollars starts to add up especially for teams that work on a budget. Yeah, and then on top of that, the error bars are in a certain way. So, like, if you're talking about a thirty dollars Tim Anderson, he might be done. You know, a thirty year thirty year old Tim Anderson, he might be done. And if you're the Giants and you have Marco Luciano, and you say, "Well, sober projection projections say Marco Luciano is maybe a one to one and a half win player," but given his age, the error bars are that he could be a two or three or four win player, you know, like those, that's where the error skews. Whereas for Tim Anderson, the error seems to skew a little bit more towards the he's, he's done category, you know? Um, so if you are a team, like neither one of these guys, not, Tim Anderson's not really going to be an option for a team like the Yankees or Dodgers, right? Most likely. Because they want to get past two wins at their shortstop position. They don't want to sign someone who locks them into one win at shortstop, you know? Um, and so you end up going to these teams that are cheaper and often worse. And those teams are what they're like, what's a win worth to me? It's a little surprising, even it, it, when we speak, speak this context into life, that the Marlins signed Tim Henderson, right? Because in terms of projected standings, what does that one, how much does that one win help them? Um, but because their current shortstop situation is so bad, uh, it still makes sense for them. And because the price dropped enough, it still makes sense to them. But literally, if dollars per win was linear, linear then Tim Anderson should have gotten nine to, you know, 15 million, nine to 13 million dollars. Uh, Ahmed Rosario should have gotten more than he got. So, um, if you put those two guys up against each other, um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I've heard that Tim Anderson, that Ahmed Rosario did some uh, some heavy heavy work on his swing, uh, his swing path and his bat speed this off season, and that some people are pretty excited about you know you know what he might do this year with the bat. Um, Tim Anderson, I think, is uh, the slightly better defender. Although it is funny, most of them say he's. A, like a, a decent scratch defender at short. And then DRS says he's like one of the worst defenders in the league at short. So again, this disagreement on defensive metrics, but in any case, uh, Anderson, slightly better glove, Ahmed Rosario, better bat. Um, it's going to be an interesting use case to see which one provides their team more value this year. Yeah, reunited with the uh, Jake Berger on the left side of that infield. But I think the, the <laughs> other case for Tim Anderson is that when you look at the last five seasons we just talked about 2023 and how bad that was the four years before that on a per game basis he was more of like a four to four and a half win player every year 2020 got cut short because it was 60 game season 2022 got cut short because he got hurt so you do have some health concerns given that there was a shoulder problem in 23 and he missed half the season in 22 but this is to me a, like a level or two better than a med rosario it's reflected in the difference he's three times more expensive but the fact that both of these guys are discounted I don't know. Like I, I look at Anderson, I think this is exactly the type of risk you should take if you're a team that does not have a shortstop, and that has described the Marlins for the entire offseason. So I'm kind of in as sort of a buy lowest move from a real life perspective, but I also don't mind it from a fantasy perspective because I think he can get a really clear path to be an everyday guy in Miami. And some other teams, better teams, maybe wouldn't have afforded him that opportunity. Even if he ended up with the Giants, where they mix and match so much, he may not have been a max volume player, or may not have had that possibility because of Luciano because of other guys that can play the spots they would have maybe played him if they played him at second base so uh, yeah I don't know I, I, I'm ultimately I think this is a nice move for a team that needs for, to do something for, for the Marlins it makes sense <laughs> you know like yeah, that was totally long makes way sense. yeah I'm saying that for the Marlins it makes sense and for fancy players you know uh in that draft over the weekend uh last weekend I took uh Tim Anderson because I just need you know 15 to 20 steals somewhere on my roster um, and I think, you know, there's a, at least a 50, 50 chance I get that now, because I think John birdie was never a great shortstop. Vidal Brujan had been moved off of shortstop, uh, by the Rays before, before the Marlins, Jacob Mamaya may not have a major league stick. 
these are I'm listing all the shortstop names on the Fangraphs depth chart. By the way, I'm not just like pulling up names. Nick Gordon is on that list, and Nick Gordon hasn't uh, been a real option at shortstop for a while. Xavier Edwards. I've never heard of him uh, listed as a shortstop. He was always a second base prospect, I thought. So uh, they have a, 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 a bad depth chart at shortstop. And, you know, they don't have that Marco Luciano where you're like, we're at least excited about the bat and we think he can be a glove, you know, a good enough glove. And we're going to stick him out there and see what happens. They don't have that guy, I don't think. I would agree with that. I would also look at Anderson's projection for stolen bases and say he's a little under projected 13 for 15 last year with a terrible OBP. You get some of that OBP back. That's more opportunities to run. You get the improved health, more chances to do a little damage. I think the One speed year over deal. power is what I trust. I mean, this is, this is the angle for sure. If you're looking at him as a very inexpensive option at shortstop late in your drafts. One year deal. Maybe he's fighting for his life in the, in the league, you know? Yeah, and if they, maybe there's a team that ends up needing a shortstop midseason or a second baseman midseason, and the situation gets better via midseason trade as well. Let's get into our team previews. Into the AL Central we go. We'll go to the projected top of the division and talk twins as we get started here today. Uh, this is a team that I actually like quite a bit from a, a roster construction standpoint. You look at their bats, it's a very solid group. But the interesting thing about it is it's top-heavy by, by way of, of fantasy value. Royce Lewis inside the top 50 is their only player being drafted inside the top 200 across this group of hitters. And yet, I look through the next five or six players on this list. Edward Julian, Byron Buxton, Carlos Correa, even Ryan Jeffers in two catchers, two catcher leagues, and Max Kepler. And I can see guys that I generally trust. I mean, we know this is a team that has a, a bit of an extreme swing and miss approach, but they also try to pull their fly balls. They also carry pretty high barrel rates. And I think in this division, especially, a lot of these guys can exceed expectations. It comes down to health for a few players, but Julian in particular just sort of pops now that Jorge Polanco has gone. We talked about that Jorge Polanco trade with the Mariners a few weeks ago. The door is now wide open for Julian to be a big side platoon guy at second base. And if at some point Brooks Lee, one of their top prospects is up, they could probably move Julian over to that first base DH mix. Yeah, it's an interesting group. I, I, I think Kirilov is still an interesting player. If he gets his, his wrist healthy, um, you know, it's uh, he's, He's an, he's got pop, and the one uh, other thing that popped for me off this list is you know there's Robert Orr, um, I think it's not Bobby Orr at not Bobby Orr, uh, who writes a baseball perspective, created a, a stack called Seeger, uh, named after Seeger, uh, it, that kind of tries to do what I've been doing with zone minus um, uh, reach rate, um, there's zone minus chase rate. And, um, and the idea is that, uh, being aggressive in the zone is, is a positive, um, and you have to balance that with being passive outside of the zone. Um, and so, you know, you don't want to take hittable pitches. Well, by Seeger, the twins, uh, last year had seven of the top 100 bats, hmm. um, by Seeger. So I think the two things that they value as an organization are, you know, pulled, pulled barrels, pulled fly balls. And uh, aggression in the zone, and and uh, and an eye outside the zone, and they seem to be fairly good at developing it, uh, at, at, at the scouting for it, and developing it. Because you know, Matt Walner is not an amazing outfielder that I that I need you to draft in all your leagues, but Matt Walner displays all the things that the Twins value, and so I believe in him to at least be big side platoon guy and hit 20 plus homers and be valuable in a lot of leagues and be especially valuable to the twins. So they've found this way to sort of, um, th this is the twins way of hitting. And, um, you know, there's some question about, does it lead to more strikeouts? Um, has it led to them going sort of dry in the postseason? Um, are there any sort of fallbacks to this plan? Should they have kept Luis Arias just to have one guy that's different? <laughs> you know, like, you know, but I would say that with Buxton or, you know, um, to some extent, Royce Lewis, they're not like automatons. It's not like everyone is Matt Walner. 
it would be a little bit weird if they tried to run a team of Matt Wallners out there. But um, I don't think it would work. And how are you going to argue against being like aggressive in the zone, passive outside the zone, and trying to hit pull tanks? I mean, that like, what are you going to say is bad about that? Nothing. (laughs) Yeah, hit tools are good enough, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, so kudos to them for you know kind of finding ways to develop some of these things, valuing them correctly, and the scouting process. And you know, Julian was a guy who divided a lot of people. He still has more swing and miss than than most people would like, but because he you know does certain things, he's going to be valuable in the major leagues, and he's probably going to be valuable in a lot of fantasy leagues. And I think the thing that really jumped off the page back when we were doing the second base preview is just how much success he had against righties. He had a 151 WRC plus last season. It was with a 31.1% strikeout rate. But I always got the sense from Edward Julian that his strikeout rate is more being deep into the count and less about an actual skills flaw. Like I, I think there's there's a case to make him more aggressive that would likely help that K rate come down just a little bit. Yeah, I think so. Uh, like I said, with that, with that kind of, appro- with that kind of approach and the, his minor league strikeout rates, like I'm willing to, I'm willing to forecast a little bit of an improvement there. Just think that some of the ways they make that happen to maybe hiding him from lefties, given some of the options they've got kicking around on this depth chart. I'm with you on Alex Kirilov just as a great late flyer. I think he was featured in a deep sleepers piece that went up today in the athletics draft kit. So be sure to check that out. But with Kirilov, it's just about health. I've always liked him as a hitter. He's just had so many injuries stacked on top of each other. We just don't know what to expect. Um, And I will say Royce Lewis drafting him in the fourth round of a 15 team league is exhilarating. It feels amazing. It's like being on a roller coaster because you, on the one hand, you you see the per game production and that makes you feel like you're getting maybe a first round talent. And on the other hand, you're worried about a guy that's had, you know, multiple ACL tears and the possible damage that has been done that could cause him to have, you know, other smaller injuries or uh, something else that slows him down. But I think talent wise, Royce Lewis, he does look like he passes the sniff test where it, this this could be an elite player for a long time and one that the Twins really needed to develop, right? You needed to have another guy like this on the roster. I mean, Buxton, by raw talent, probably has that, but also has been slowed by so many injuries. He hasn't really fully unlocked it over complete seasons. If Royce Lewis can be that kind of player, you know, a 30 homer, 15 to 20 steal guy at the hot corner, that's huge for this team. Yeah, I wonder what his uh, shortstop defense would look like these days. <laughs> we may never find out since Carlos Correa is there on the long term. Yeah, Carlos Correa getting older and they switch you know, him. Maybe. I mean, uh, I think first step is hey, be healthy for a year, right? And then we then we look at the numbers and we talk to the players and we see what happens. Like both of them, I mean, both of these guys need to stay healthy. I keep expecting a Carlos Correa rebound. We saw it on the screen with the projection from the bad X, and yet I'm 0 for 3 drafting Correa so far. Like, if I like him, why am I not putting him on my teams? What was the fear? Where's this coming from? For who? For Carlos Correa. Like, I, I keep saying he's an amazing bargain, and yet when the time I mean, comes yeah, to get you him, have I, the same, you have the same, you have the same issues as Royce Lewis is like, how much do I trust the health? But, you know, it is kind of interesting. 640, 590, 580 plate appearance is not terrible. Hmm. I mean, uh, in daily leagues, especially, and then in like sort of draft and hold situations or places where you have an option to paper over when he's hurt, then that's fine. And the the numbers suggest that he should be able to, you know, hit two. I think I'm a little surprised that the projections on his batting average are so low. Uh, I would say like a 280, 25 season is well within reach. Right, with good counting stats to go along with it, too. We like the lineup. We like the playing set situation. I mean, the the longer-term concerns about his health are real, but I think the shorter-term concerns are slightly overestimated by the market right now at that ADP sitting around pick 240 for Carlos Correa. Let's talk about the pitching. This is the area where, if you said, what could hold the Twins back in the AL Central this year? It's the starting pitching not coming through. It's a group that I would say is okay not great or that I I like but I don't love Pablo Lopez has kind of pitched his way into that upper tier where he is their standout number one starter right now we've seen Joe Ryan 
go through some pretty major adjustment issues and, and struggle to keep the ball in the park. So I wonder, like, what does this season bring for Ryan in particular? For Lopez, it's like, if he's healthy, he's good. That's it. It's just, yeah, he's how much right. do you trust him to avoid injuries given he, what happened prior to 2022? He added a sweeper, which is perfect. Uh, a perfect match for his changeup. Uh, it's basically two pitches that kind of go in opposite directions. Uh, got two fastballs. Like it's it's a he's got a refined approach uh, and he's got good command and it's just all about health. Joe Ryan, the interesting thing is that he just he needs a secondary pitch still. He's still searching for. It. He still has this good fastball. Still has good command, but because he throws his fastball so much up in the zone, he's let and and he doesn't really have a secondary pitch that they have to honor too much. Uh, that hitters have to honor, um, he gives up homers like nobody's business. And, uh, it, you know, he's been fooling around with a gyro slider, like a harder, tighter slider, and he's been fooling around with a sweeper, and he kind of used one and the other, and they tried to use both. Uh, the split finger looks okay, but it also got beat up because I think he used it in counts in ways that was predictable because the movement looks fine, but the, the, the results weren't great. So... Um, I, if I could bequeath upon him a breaking ball, I would. And I think that's that's what stands between Joe Ryan and the next level. As is, um, I don't know. There was this. I remember back in the day, Ted Lilly. I think good command, um, <clears throat> low whips, higher ERAs than you expected because he had a higher home run problem than you expected, and that's. Yeah. That's sort of that's my comp for guys that have a that have a legitimate home run issue. Hmm. I was going to go a little more favorable <laughs> from a statistical perspective. That's exactly the way I was thinking, like low whip, higher ERA. I was thinking more like a Kenta Maeda because you get a higher K rate from Ryan. Like Ted mm -hmm. Lilly was a little bit more in that uh, Jordan Montgomery bucket of, of 20, 22 percent mm. K rates, like kind of lower end of the scale, especially for it's the also era. a different time. So maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe like, you have to kind of adjust to that. his time. It's about the same. But I think being above average in whip and being kind of average in ERA, I think sometimes that makes you a little undervalued. I think people look at an ERA like Ryan's and it just kind of downgrade him too much and they lose sight of him being actually good you in the other that. category. You saw that projected ERA is better than average. Yeah. You know, that's the it, like four three is is the is the league average last year, and it might go up if the offensive environment continues to go up. So, you know, if he gets to if he pitches to a four two ERA with a twenty five percent strikeout rate, um, he's going to be valuable. Um, you know, the down downfield from that, Louis Varland was on my on my uh, breakout pitchers list. Um, Bailey Ober, it's possible uh, that projection just totally misses the mark uh, because he's a pretty unique uh, guy in terms of mechanics. Um, and, um, you know, with Simeon Woods Richards and Anthony Discafani, at least they have, I think, competent depth. The news is that Discafani, if he's healthy, is going to date that fifth spot. I, I do think that over the course of the season, Louis Varlin is going to bubble to the top and take that job. I still. I still like him. There's a fair amount uh, that depends on Chris Paddock, though. If you just listen to the way we're describing this, like you can fudge things around with your fifth guy, but if you're fudging things around with your fourth and fifth guy, are you a contender or are you just hoping to get in for a wild card? And so Chris Paddock is a bit of a linchpin there. He came back last year and threw some. Um, but if you uh, look at this chart that we've got, up right now, this is Chris Paddock's average vertical break on his fastball. He used to have great uh, vertical break. Then he threw the cutter and came in 2020 in with this cutter that totally turfed the vertical break on his four seam. Then he tried to come back and find it again, uh, and he did to some extent. But post-injury, uh, his vertical break was not quite uh, where it was before. So... Um, if you look at the comps of, you know, if you take Chris Paddock's fastball that he had a 95 mile per hour average on as a reliever, and then you take, you take what you normally take off of fastball stuff when you move a guy from relieving to starting. So he goes from a 96 uh, stuff plus on the fastball to a 91. Um, the best comps for him that I could find were Nick Martinez, Mike Lorenzen, um, 
and JP France. And here's the weird thing about Nick Lorenzen, Mike, uh, Nick Lorenzen, Nick Martinez, Mike <laughs> Lorenzen, and JP France. They all have a pitch other than the fastball and the change that are better than anything Paddock has thrown. They or said more simply, all of them had wider arsenals than yeah. Chris Paddock. So is Chris Paddock going to get away with a okay-ish fastball and a good change and not great breaking balls? Um, that's a big question. I had him higher over the course of ranking. He just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And right now, uh, I've dropped him all the way to 75 because of my most recent look at this. In fact, while preparing for this, I, I dropped him down to 75. I, I think with Paddock, we've seen him you know, working in San Diego at the beginning of his career. He put up the one impressive season as a rookie and hasn't really ever found it at that same level since. Hasn't been atrocious, but just hasn't been that guy. And then, of course, he's been hurt. And then you pull back and say, okay, if he hasn't really done it before, like if we don't see that third pitch, why believe it's going to happen now? Their depth is going to be tested in Minnesota. I think that's what makes Varlin kind of interesting as a, a breakout candidate, as you, as you pointed out. Like I, I look at this this organization, and I think just as they have a pretty clear goal for their hitters, like with their approach, they have a certain pitcher type they like. They they're fine with guys that give up homers as long as they don't walk a lot of guys. Walks, that's, yeah. that's everybody. Even Anthony Descafani, who's kind of in that six starter role right now, what does he do well? Limits free passes. Doesn't always miss a lot of bats. The problem is he gives up a ton of homers. Some of that was in Cincinnati, so you kind of give him a pass and you go, oh, wait a minute, even at Oracle for half of his games, he was giving up a lot of home runs these last couple of seasons. Bailey Ober has that problem. Doesn't walk a lot of guys, gives up homers. Kent Amada, who they used fourth, to have, same thing. Fourth best in the big leagues last year in walk rate. Yeah, and it's just that's that's what they're searching for. Um, I even look down as far as Simeon Woods Richardson and think he's probably going to get some starts this year. There have been times when I looked at the pitching plus model and it looks like Simeon Woods Richardson looks good at Triple A. So I'm kind of curious what you think he might bring to the table if he gets a chance. Yeah, I you know he keeps jumping around every time we run an update on the model, and, and so I think he's got a pretty unique uh, situation right now. I just don't know if I believe this. Uh, there's a 39 stuff plus on his four seam fastball. That's so low it makes me think maybe it's okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's <weird>. like <laughs> that is really weird, and the and the secondary stuff still still rates as well. So it uh, uh, still still rates well. So I would, uh, he's a guy I have circled as with big question marks next to him. And, and, and for what it's worth, his results have been really up and down. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a four, nine, one ERA in 113 innings in AAA last year with a 19% strikeout rate and a 12% walk rate. If you're looking at, uh, if you're looking at, projecting him off of those you would not project him well i would put this out there with no time to do the actual study but i would wonder if a command dependent starter at triple a with the abs system might have been the most susceptible to a rapid skill shift because his 2023 numbers it was 113 and two-thirds innings it was, it was bad 491 era 150 whip 19% K rate, 12% walk rate. This, this shouldn't really be the pitcher he is based on all the past results. Lots of swinging strikes moving through the system prior to last year. Multiple organizations too. Drafted by the Mets, acquired by the Jays, then acquired by the Twins. So he's moved around a little bit, been in a few different orgs. Hasn't typically had a home run problem. That's been a problem for him in the very, very brief times he's been in the big leagues. We're talking about less than 10 innings, so he can't put much stock into that. I just think this is this would be a lodum situation if he if he qualifies. I know he's a second round pick and he's been on prospect list for a long time, but I'm gonna I, circle I'm anybody with a 40 fastball stuff plus. <laughs> be like, yeah. what is that? The extreme anti model pick. Yeah. Mr. Lodum 2024, I think, is Simeon, Simeon Woods Richardson. Richardson. Wouldn't be Love surprised it. to see him make more than a few starts for this team, just given some of the needs they may have in the rotation. Uh, bullpen looks really good beyond Joanne Duran, who's one of the most fun starter or one of the most fun relievers to watch. It's not loaded with household names, but it's got quality and a lot of different looks they can give you. So I think that's going to oh, be a strength great. for this club. 
And I think actually Duran, uh, John Duran, who threw the fastest off-speed pitch in the history of baseball, um, is undervalued in drafts. I think he's there's nothing I want from him that he hasn't shown and that he shouldn't show in the future in terms of strikeouts, home run suppression, outstanding stuff. He averaged 101.8 on the four seam last year. Like there's he has a 66% ground ball rate. He's like Bruzar Gratterall times two squared, although not not like sort of physically, that would be a very large human being. Like 200 um, pounds. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, more uh, I think he's absolutely in my circle of trust and he goes a little bit later. Like he goes as one of the later options. I, I, uh, I found myself waiting a little bit um, on saves, maybe uh, to the extreme. I'm in a draft right now that I absolutely hate so much. <laughs> Um, and I don't know how I've been making these decisions and have ended up with this team. Um, just to tell you how much I hate it, this is my staff. I guess I waited too long. Fromber is my ace. Bobby Miller is my number two. Clay Holmes is my first closer, and Kenley Jansen is my second. I don't know how I did this, but I guess I did it by waiting. Clay Holmes is a great model. Clay Holmes, yeah, it's pretty good. Clay Holmes uh, in my model is projected really well. I really wish I had gotten Duran there, but then it would have cost me Bobby Miller. So, you know, <laughs> you, you make these choices, you end up with a team. I think I'm going to hate this team's guts, and uh, somehow it'll be the team that does the best. One of the teams I like the least, it would have to be football instead of baseball, but I've drafted it and thought it was absolute garbage. <laughs> it, it cashed in the NFFC like eight years ago, and I got a golden doodle from it. So you just never know. <laughs> I know you don't need any more pets, but Hazel is part of our family in small part because, because of that. that was That's the year. Crazy. Like, hey, we got some extra money coming. Let's let's get the dog. We probably would have got her anyway. But I, I that's what the winnings went toward, and uh, I didn't like that team at all when I built it. It turned out to be really good. It was, it was a easy easy ride to the top of the league. Dakota projection from baseball prospectus, 89.2 wins, first place in the AL Central, too hot, too cold, or just right for the Twins. How much was it? 89.2. I'm not saying it's, I'm definitely not saying it's too cold. If anything, too hot. I had too hot slightly listed on the rundown in my very <laughs> safe place on the rundown. It's just, well, in <laughs> I think they're going to win the division. I think it's going to take like 85 or 86 games to do it. I, I think the way Picota sort of under projected the just, NL Central, the I think they over projected the AL Central. Yeah, maybe the, the injury bars are, are in the wrong direction for me. You mm -hmm. know, um, we, we have Correa and Buxton and Royce Lewis who have to be among the most injury risked, you know, uh, position players in baseball. And then, just taking them aside, like how impossible is it that somebody who doesn't have a high injury risk gets injured? <laughs> uh, Kirilov. Put Kirilov in there as one of the highest injury risks. Yeah. And yeah. then Kirilov, Lewis, Buxton, well, bad, at least bad Kepler. Histories. At least we'll run Kepler out there every year. Well, what if Kepler... I mean, Kepler is actually... I don't know if it's platooning, but like he hasn't hit more than 500 plate appearances the last three years. What if he, you know, tears a groin or something, you know? Like this, this team uh, has wide error bars, I guess I would say. I'll buy that. But yeah, I think they are the best team in the division. I think that part is right. So slightly too hot. Not going to throw hands over it with that projection <laughs> for uh, 89. I'm going to throw hands. Can it's you imagine? 87.5. Can you imagine getting a case of the ass so bad that you would fight over a projection? <laughs> I can't. I can't. I, I have had in the back of my head just the slightest bit of, of nervousness sometimes on meetups about like, is someone ever going to come? Any of these people that are in my mentions that are super mad is <laughs> ever going to come and want to throw hands about something? It's like I just I'm not interested in fighting. Like I, it's no. not it's not my thing. Never has been. One fight in my whole life. <laughs> yeah, I think. Same. And guess what it was about. Guess what it was about. 
Xbox? Yes! <laughs> it was about camping in Goldeneye on the 64. <laughs> <laughs> One of my friends was like, was, was celebrating something about, you know, killing me uh, like three or four times in a row or something. You know, we used to play Golden Gun in the temple a lot. And like, he <laughs> would, she, he like killed me four times in a row with four single shots because the Golden Gun is like one shot. And, and I was like, you're camping next to the golden gun. It's not a great skill. And then all of a sudden we were fighting on the couch. That's the last fight I've been in. Yeah, that's about the same era. I think the only time I got into a fight was around the same time. It wasn't over golden eye, but absolutely in that phase of life. Let's move on to the Cleveland Guardians. There's two preview. more teams to do. Jesus. Yeah, we got to we got to reel this one in. Yeah. Uh, this is a this is a team that I think could be a little better in their lineup because they will use Bo Naylor presumably for the entire season as their primary catcher. He makes them better. They will likely use Kyle Manzardo for at least a half season and hopefully more. I, I think they might as well, given the state of the first base DH situation, you could just use Manzardo and Josh Naylor as your combo and mix and match those guys and play them a ton. I hope that's what they do. And then it's just kind of more of the same, right? They, they seem to like Esteban Florial I like him more than you do. I don't know if he makes their lineup a lot better. He's fun from a fantasy perspective. He's chewing up a lot of playing time in that outfield. I like him more than Miles Straw, just from the simple fact that he could be a power speed combo with a low batting average. But like, what what is wrong with Cleveland? If you described the Twins and their approach and wanting to pull fly balls and having a smart approach, like spitting on stuff outside the zone, taking more aggressive approaches inside the zone... I can't figure out what it is the Guardians want to really do other than just make contact. And it doesn't seem like there's enough damage in the profile of many, many of the bats that they've got that they're going to rely on again. I mean, the the anti-twins. The twins had the worst strikeout rate in baseball last year. And uh, the Guardians had the best strikeout rate in baseball last year. The Twins had the fifth best isolated slugging in baseball last year, and the Guardians had the worst isolated slugging percentage in in baseball last year. The Twins had the second best barrel rate in baseball last year, and the Guardians had the worst. You know, the Twins were fourth in hard hit rate, and the Guardians were last. Um, and so, you know, they are, it's pretty funny to have these guys, and I think it's good for baseball. Um, that there are these two, that there are people trying to do different things. But I would say that if you, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't think the runs matter most for a player, uh, but runs matter a lot for the team in the end. And Minnesota had the 10th most runs and Cleveland had the fourth least. Um, so I do think that, Cleveland needs pop. I'm hoping that the idea is you take a bunch of guys who control the zone, make contact, um, and you hope they fill out into power. Um, and that worked for Jose Ramirez and Francisco Lindor, but it hasn't uh, come to fruition yet for Andres Jimenez, um, uh, for any of the, you know, Tyler Freeman. Uh, Brian Rocchio, Stephen Kwan types. Um, Josh Naylor, I think, for what it's worth, was already hitting for decent power before he got there. Um, he was kind of a league average guy that, you know, improved a tiny bit with Cleveland. Um, but he controls his own. So they, I think, have a, a lot riding on Bo Naylor and Cal Manzardo because those are the only two players that can really in my mind add power this year and common zardo again is a guy who makes good contact we talked to him at the arizona fall league about a possible hole up in the zone seems to be covering it all right um and um his power is not elite in terms of barrels and exit velocities and things like that but it should be another sort of 25 homerish guy uh, Bo Naylor should be another 25 homerish guy. So just adding guys who are slightly above average in power, if they can bring, if they can keep that league average best strikeout rate and get to middle of the pack in homers, we could see uh, enough offense if their pitching is good. 
Yeah, right? I think they're they're probably more of a team that if everything were to click, they'd be close to a league average offense that still doesn't hit that many homers. They're mm-hmm. third from the bottom in homers of the last three seasons combined. Even with a few young guys, you're not going to completely flip that. And that, that accounts for the possibility of Chase DeLauder coming up by the end of the season. He put together pretty nice numbers in the minors around an injury last year and looked pretty good in the fall league, too. He walked more than he struck out. He had five homers, five steals during his time in Arizona. So like, there's some some hope there. And a guy like Rocchio, for me, if you said, hey, make another call like that Geraldo Perdomo call from last year, it's Rocchio. He'll play a lot. He can steal some bases. Occasionally, he might run into a homer. He controls the zone well. It's a lot of the same skills. And the little bit of time we saw him in the big leagues, the contact quality was was brutal. If you go back to AAA last season, 31.6% hard hit rate, that's really nothing to write home about either. It doesn't point to a big outcoming, uh, outpouring of power on the horizon. But if he's a six to eight homer guy that could actually steal 25 to 30 bases, play good defense at short, and get on base enough to maybe be high in the lineup, that actually works that makes him kind of a deep league sleeper of sorts so that's sort of my like best case sort of short-term outcome for brian rocchio not but it's like more of the same like how is that different than andres jimenez like maybe a better obp and a little less power but i don't know and andres jimenez has more power potential i think mm-hmm. so yeah i'm not i'm not super into brian rocchio uh, there's others who have a more positive sheen on it. I think, you know, from running a real life team, he's probably fine. Right. But, and, and, and to maybe to some extent, the guardians have found like, Hey, these turn into real life players, you know? And if we just turn guys into real life players, maybe at some point we'll be like the Cardinals where we just have a ton of two win type players and we can package them together and get a star. Although would they be able to afford that money wise? I don't know. It's, you know, it's. I think it seems to be a little bit more of a fascination of on floor, mm-hmm. you know, um, and f- I guess floor is good if you don't have much money and you just need to keep producing guys with floors. So you have average players everywhere, but um, and then maybe you just think, well, if we f- if we f- if we focus on floor, then every once in a while one of those floor guys turns into Jose Ramirez, I guess. But what if Jose Ramirez was like your Nolan Ryan, you know? <laughs> And it just happens once every, you know, 40 years and you're and you're focused on, oh, let's just do this Jose Ramirez process again. And you're just never going to get it again. So I, I don't <laughs> I don't know um, about that move on the pitching side. There is a similar idea, I think, that, you know, let's take guys with good command, good breaking ball command, um, you know, good command somewhere and try to coach up the rest, try to give them weighted balls, try to get some more. um uh, get some more velo in there. It worked really well for Shane Bieber at the beginning of his career. In fact, Shane Bieber has gone back to the well um, and uh, went back to driveline this offseason and tried to repeat some of that. And we've seen some good velocity readings. So, you know, Bieber, in fact, you know, at his prices, is something I'm excited about. Uh, but Bybee uh, versus McKenzie and Gavin Williams um, is just really interesting to me because, um, you know, Bybee has the best breaking ball, not named Shane Bieber on this team. Um, and he, he doesn't have a great fastball and he has league average locations. So it's, it, it doesn't, it sort of breaks my model for them um, where Gavin Williams has a, a really nice fastball, um, but his secondaries aren't as good as, as Bybee's. And um, I, I think there's a fascinating thing here where there's 60 60 points of ADP between them and I have them right next to each other. Mm. Um, so in fact, I don't know which one to, 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 to prefer. So <laughs> Bybee has this elite breaking ball. I want to show you a video. I want to show you two videos real quick. Gavin Williams. Um, here is Gavin Williams giving up a dong on the curveball. Well, that looks like a terrible curveball. I mean, 75 on the plate, and Michael Bush just took it deep. Yeah. Well, let's watch Gavin Williams uh, whiffing Corey Seager on a curveball in the same place, <laughs> 77. And I did look, and I don't think Velo is necessarily the key. I just, Stuff Plus doesn't like Gavin Williams' curveball, 
And it's very important because I don't think his changeup is great. If he can be fastball, slider, curveball, he has a good enough fastball that he could be better than Bybee. But if he's fastball, slider, and the curveball gets hit tank by Michael Bush a lot, then uh, then he's not going to be better than Tanner Bybee. So uh, two fascinating young pitchers. I think Bybee's a little bit over his skis uh, where he's being drafted. And I think Gavin Williams is under his skis. And I think you could draft Bybee, Bieber, and Williams all 150 to 160 uh, and profit. Um, but in, in, in reality, you'll probably just get Bieber and Williams, two guys I'm very interested in. I, I like Bybee a little bit, but I would agree with your assessment. Like He needs to fall just a little bit for me to feel like I'm not giving up something better, even just among starting pitchers, other guys in that range that, that pop for me. You have some would-you-rathers. Ooh, I can make some. <laughs> Before I throw those at you, uh, I just think Tristan McKenzie is a really fascinating risk re- reward option where he goes. He's outside the top 200 right now. He entered spring training healthy, healthy for now. And we've seen one really good season. 2022 was excellent. It was 191 innings with 190 Ks, a 296 ERA, and a .95 whip. That's really, really good. He also breaks my description of the of the Guardians because he started throwing harder and lost his command. So he doesn't have great command. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that's going against him. But command, we know, is not super sticky year to year. So what if he's feeling good, feeling healthy, and can, can repeat his delivery better this year and has good command? He has good stuff. I mean, he has at least you know league average stuff. If you're looking at, at and you're saying 100 stuff plus for a starting pitcher, that can't be good. It is. Because we were talking about starting pitching where the average stuff plus is below 100. So the Bybee problem, here's the would you rather Bybee problem. In a lot of instances, I'm either looking for my late closer one or possibly a closer two in this range. And here are the closers that all go within 10 picks of Bybee in each direction. Andres Munoz, Paul Seawald, Pete Fairbanks, Tanner Scott, and Ryan Helsley. And I like Munoz and Helsley. Like I love them. Oh, and Evan Phillips is in there too. I mean, Munoz and Helsley. I'd be jumping at those guys if it was it was them. So with all of those guys there, and knowing that there's often runs where that whole cluster goes, Evan Phillips is in there too. I'm yeah, trying. To how do you think I ended up with Kenley Jansen as the second closer? Right. <laughs> so, like for me, the would you rather is would you rather have Bybee or would you rather have one of those closers? Most likely, I need one of those closers. And there's other pitchers that comp just fine to buy me value wise that I'm going to get two or three rounds later or even Bieber like different different scenario but Bieber being available 30 picks later kind of works against me drafting by B in that spot Dylan Cease goes up against by B ADP wise so you have to think about that as a straight up would you rather Cole Reagans versus by B <laughs> yeah I'm taking Cease and Reagans so yeah, I mean, I think uh, like above his ski, above his skis in terms of how the market treats him, I think is totally fair. He's a good pitcher. He's just yeah. going a little earlier than he should. He goes twenty picks ahead of Hunter Green. I think it's an elite slider, and he's going to figure out how to put things around it. If the command was elite, then you know I could I could anoint him the next Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's sort of how you describe Bieber. But you can see even by the stuff numbers that and location numbers, the Bieber's locations were better. And this is. This is 95 stuff plus some Bieber. That's like late Bieber. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, it looks, it looks a lot like Bieber and maybe like Bieber, he'll overproduce some of the models, but um, yeah, I, I, at price, I'm more in on, on Gavin Williams and Tristan McKenzie because they're a lot cheaper. I know there was some rumbling. Some folks have concerns about Emmanuel Class A. Just to reiterate, I think you and I do not have those concerns. A lot looks good with Class A. I think he keeps this job. The only thing that would happen, a trade, would probably put him in a spot to close somewhere else. So uh, I have well, no reservations. A, uh, upon rerun, he didn't have the very lowest uh, projected ERA using Stuff Plus, the PPERA, but he's had like like the third best. So like, yeah, still good. Uh, I, I believe the run suppression. And I, I think the Ks are going to come back a little bit. Do you have a, a deep sleeper at all from their other pitching candidates? I mean, we talked about the kind of the big Joey four. Cantillo is fun. Yeah, Joey Cantillo is fun. He has a really good changeup. Um, he's had some injury issues, but if he's healthy, if the fastball velo is there, he could overtake Logan Allen. 
Uh, okay. I'm not I'm not going to necessarily predict that from day one, but like over the course of the season, uh, if they if you if Logan Allen is is scuffling and Cantillo is doing great in the minors, maybe you do something where you pick up Cantillo a week early instead of a week late. Dakota, 83.1 wins for the Guardians. Too hot, too cold, or just right? I'm going to go a little too cold. Hmm. I believe in Comanzardo. I believe in Bo Naylor. I believe, I believe that that's going to be what they need to add. Plus, I just said some really nice things about Gavin Williams and Tristan McKenzie. And, you know, <laughs> it's good I pitching. Think I, think I think they're in the going in the right direction. I've got it just right, but that would put them like still in a very close battle with the twins. The twins are still the favorite to win the division. And I see them closer to 85. Then this goes down to the final days of the season. So absolutely in the mix to, to win it in the AL central health in the rotation in particular is going to be a key for the guardians as it is pretty much every year. Let's close it out for today with the tigers. The hitting snapshot looks a little better than the last time we talked about this club in great detail, right? You start to see pieces coming together Spencer Torkelson pulling more fly balls last year, kind of earning the Pete Alonzo light moniker in draft room so far uh, this draft season. We've talked about Riley Green a few times as someone that has that full breakout potential, still working his way back from Tommy John on his non-throwing elbow, but should be totally fine for opening day. Uh, I, I think that average you're seeing on the screen, 265 is a tick light. I think we'll see him be kind of plus in that category. The developing power, a little bit of speed, all good things for Riley Green, a really balanced player across the board. It's the secondary players that you look at and say, how much do you believe in these guys? How much do you buy you know, Kerry Carpenter, at least as a big side platoon masher? I know you like Parker Meadows. We talked a lot about him on one of our outfield previews a couple of weeks back. What else do you think is good about this supporting cast? Colt Keith got that extension. He's third base eligible in a lot of leagues. He's going to play second base. And I just saw a tweet I think from Brendan Tuma, underdog, Colt Keith didn't have a bad lefty split. He was just as good against lefties as he was against righties at AAA, which does and bode well for his chances of just breaking through and being the everyday second baseman right away. In terms of uh, his history, I think that makes a lot of sense because when he first came up, he was a let it travel guy and uh, he learned to add pull to his game. And to me, I, I kind of love that. When I see that, it means he still has the let it travel in his bag. And if you're a lefty facing a lefty, maybe you take the reduction in power to see that ball a little bit longer. Because if you think about it, I think my personal theory is that one of the reasons why we have platoon splits the way we have, some of it must be you just don't see lefties as much. That's part, <laughs> right? And a, uh, another reason, I think, is that um, you... Uh, you have basically one eye on the ball. You know, if you if you think about release points, and we know that certain release points um, produce bigger platoon splits, well, think about a guy, a lefty, throwing sidearm to a lefty. You would not see that ball with your left eye for, like, for at least a couple seconds, you know? It would kind of come out of a blind spot in a way. And if you have let it travel in your bag, then you say... Phew, man, I can't see this guy. I'm going to try and react to it. You know, I'm going to let it, I'm going to, I'm going to try and see it a little bit longer. Um, I think that would lead to smaller platoon splits. So I really, I, I'm in love with Colt Keith, dude. I, I don't know. I talked to him at the fall league. He said all the right things. I love this process of being a let a travel guy and adding pull power to it. 110 max EV, 40% hard hit at triple a. There's no softness to his, you know, he's not getting to those isolated slugging percentages with his legs. I wish he, I wish he stole a little bit more. I wish he was a little bit more of an athlete that way. Um, and he, so I don't know that he's going to be a guy that could jump into the first couple of rounds, uh, you know, in terms of upside. Um, but I think he's going to be a really solid player. I love the walk rates and strikeout rates. Uh, you know, I think it's a really good package. Parker Meadows is also similar. I'm not sure that Parker Meadows is ever going to be a star in this league, but if you just look at every single aspect of his game, it's either average or better than average. I mean, 9.4% swing strike rate. That's better than average. 8% uh, barrel rate. That's slightly better than average. It's not Great, but it's slightly better than average. 108.5, 110.8 max EV in, in AAA, that's better than average. 
35, 39% hard hit rate at AAA and, and major leagues, that's better than average. 11% walk rate, better than average. O swing, better than average. Everything is better than average. The speed is probably one of his better tools, which is good for fantasy. Um, and so I see a guy who could go like 250, 20, 20 with a, with a good OBP, um, but is already projected for 230, 15, 15. So I'm not like pushing the numbers too hard when I say that. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, considering he's 24, got his first taste and was around league average, like there's a potential for him to kind of put things together in a second attempt. So I'm into Parker Meadows uh, for that reason. Both of them, I'm not sure, becomes a star. If there's a star on this team, it's still Riley Green for me. Um, but he had some uh, some bad offseason news uh, with regard to to health. Um, so I don't know if this is going to be the year that he you know breaks into the stratosphere. But a lot of the process numbers uh, that he shows are closer to elite than almost anybody else on the team. Yeah, I, I think Riley Green could be. A really nice five category player it might be a little bit lighter in steals than other five category players, but you get extra juice in the batting average to sort of help offset that. And I think the Parker Meadows risk comes in that batting average category, but mm -hmm. he can go 2020 with a 225 average. If he's walking enough, playing good defense at center field, they're going to keep playing him. Um, there's a few other role players here. I mean, Jake Rogers got to a lot of power last year. He's kind of interesting in deep two catcher leagues. If you wait too long and just need someone who's going to play a lot. Uh, the key thing is just sort of like, is the, is the short term ceiling 20, 25, 30 home run power? Because long term, it's at the higher end of that scale. It's the question of how quickly he gets to it. I think that's sort of the, the question I keep wrestling with at the price. He doesn't have to hit 30 home runs. And I think having a guy that becomes second and third base eligible that should play a lot, good average, good power, good run production, that could be a really nice value at cost on Colt Keith. One thing I'm noticing is that Javier Baez is uh, so far he's he's a fascinating case for me personally. It's it's, it's a guy that I have not um, wanted to draft for a really long time. I've missed some of his good seasons. I've missed all of his bad seasons, and now I am back in to some extent <laughs> because he's at a 530 ADP. He's gonna be their shortstop, I think, and like mm -hmm. he's projected for 14 homers, 14 stolen bases, and a 250 average, like. Uh, I, I feel like he's a really good draft and hold backup shortstop. I, I think probably in mono leagues this year, he's going to go for less money than he should. Like I have your bias. Like why not? You know, at this point it, it's, it's free money, I think. So, you know, I did not like him when he was a, a top pick though. No, I, I always had a hard time when he was going in the early rounds with that power speed combo and that, that wild approach. Uh, it looks like they've got Keston here and now kind of battling Justin Henry Malloy for what will be some kind of right-handed hitting DH limited position bat to start the season. If Malloy could just become passable in left field, it would really help his cause in the long run because it doesn't sound like the Tigers actually want to play him at third base at the big league level. So I would watch in, in spring training a lot of times where a person is playing, where they're hitting the lineup and when they leave. Um, and how many plate appearances they get is a big clue about what groups they're in. Are they in the major league group uh, or are they in the minor league group? That starts to happen later in spring training. The, does he come in in the six or does he start in the first? You know, does he does he is he one of those that group of players that's walking off with bags? You know, it's the weirdest part of spring training where you see all the starters just get up and walk off with bags in the sixth inning. And like, it is, is he weird. in that group or uh, is he in the group that stays? And what position is next to his name in the lineup? That's I think going to be pretty important for Malloy this year um, as he goes into into spring training. Does he have a three o'clock tea time or is he going to top golf after dinner? That's the question. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong yeah. with top golf, but um, you know, if you're gonna be a key regular on a team, you you're playing golf at three. You're not playing golf at after dinner on the simulators. <laughs> Let's go to the pitching side. Uh, Tarek Skubel, we've talked about him several times this draft season, just sort of pops in terms of where he's being drafted, being treated like an ace, and touching a hundred in bullpen sessions this spring. So uh, expect that ADP to creep up even just a little bit more because that's only going to add fuel to the fire. Yeah. I mean, he's projected so well by some of the projection systems. Um, and so he's already popping in, in, in the, 
in the auction calculator, 332 ERA from Steamer with 10, 10.4 strikeouts per nine. That's uh, makes him like the third best pitcher, starting pitcher in baseball. But I, I quibble a little bit with that 171 innings from Steamer for uh, a guy that the high water mark has been 149 and that was in 2021 and, and since has had some injury issues um i think i'm a little bit closer actually to uh the zips projection of a 365 era let's see we have we have a 369 era with uh with stuff plus um and that makes him a valuable pitcher but uh more of a you know 10 through 20th ranked pitcher um, and that's, uh, where I put him. I've gotten close. Uh, I had him on the queue, uh, when I was waiting for Bobby Miller, but, uh, thankfully he went right before Bobby Miller and I got to take Bobby Miller. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I have him right ahead of Bobby Miller in my ranks. And I was sort of means testing that to see what would happen if I had the choice between the two. Um, uh, just the projections are so good. You got to be in on that. And then after that, it's a little bit like the twins lineup where you've got the guy, who everybody wants, and then um, uh, 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 an assorted platter that'll be available wherever you want them. Um, I think, uh, you know, Kenta Maeda is very interesting because he still has this great splitter. But one thing I noticed was um, in in counts that the hitters ahead or early in the count, uh, like this is going zero zero, or if he's falling behind one o two o, he's basically a fastball slider guy. Um, and he's trying to sneak the fastball value because it's getting worse and worse and worse. And so he's using the slider basically as a fastball, but he's sneaking some fastballs in there so you can't sit slider. I just wonder how much that game is going because he has to be able to get to counts where he can throw his uh, splitter. Um, and you know, at some point, that fastball is going to be so bad that he might not even get to those counts. So I think there's just a collapse potential here you see it with somebody like hanjin ru like no major league team signed him he went to korea because his fastball was under 89 and it was just that was it and nobody even though he had okay era in a small sample teams are like we just don't we don't believe in you um he didn't take that much money from his korean team so um you know kenta made i feel like it's close to that i'm a little bit more interested in reese olsen who has a good slider, a good changeup, and I've got a, a chart here that just shows that he added um, two or three inches, uh, depending on sort of how you count it, um, a vertical uh, drop over his um, o- over his worst changeup. So by the end of the season, he had his best changeup going. And uh, what I see is a slider and changeup. I really like two fastballs that aren't great by stuff, but location plus says he locates them well. So, and, and they are also like 93, 94, not like 90, 91, like Maeda. So maybe he turns into a Maeda later in his career. But at this point, I think there's still upside for him to be, um, you know, a, a top half starting pitcher. Yeah, Reese Olsen is pretty interesting. And we kind of saw the best version of him at the big league level last year. So that improvement on the changeup is something I didn't know about until you put it on the rundown. So I'm, I'm excited to see what he can do with a full season of that. I think he's pretty safely in their core group of five, given the injury histories of the likes of Flaherty, Manning, and Mize. This is also a team that could go to a six-man rotation and, and kind of justify it just because Maeda, for most of his career, has had some durability concerns. Some How many innings are you going to get out of Scooble? Scooble's injury risk is pretty high, and I say that as someone who doesn't run away from early injury risk among pitchers, but I, I think they've got the depth to possibly pull it off if their core group that they like stays healthy. Um, Sawyer Gibson Long, who looked pretty good late in the year last year, has a groin strain right now, so he's slowed down here in the early days of spring training. Mize is just kind of a, a wild card for me just because the, the things that made him go 1-1 coming out of Auburn just don't really seem to be his bread and butter, right? That splitter was just so nasty, and it just seems like it's really kind of faded away for him over the time he's been in the Tigers organization. If that comes back, that changes things a lot for me, just in terms of some strikeout expectations, too. I think you see it in the projections. This is a guy that once upon a time probably would have been projected for more like a 25 plus percent K rate, and now he's sitting under 20 percent. Um, yeah, I tend to, I've been reaching more for Manning uh, than Mize, um, because uh, I, I neither one of them is projected for big strikeout rates, but Manning has seemed a little bit healthier recently. I feel like I can bank on more innings. 
Um, and I think he's a little undervalued. Um, both of these guys, I think, are going to factor in before long. And if I had to make a sort of hot takey uh, prediction about this rotation is that Jack Flaherty's in the bullpen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how it resolves itself uh, if everyone's healthy and they, they need to do this. Um, because I think Sir Gibson Long deserves at least one more shot at uh, at starting uh, before he's made into a reliever. And um, so that gives them really seven guys that are credible major league starters, and I don't think you go to a seven-man rotation. Of course, injury can sort this all out for itself. Yeah, and I would also add my expectation would be they would give Flaherty a shot first and use options on someone like Sawyer Gibson Long yeah. and then make that change later in the season. So yeah, that's um, exactly I don't think, I don't, how I see I don't, it. I don't think your hot take was Jack Flaherty is going to be a bullpen guy on opening day. I don't, Not I don't necessarily, no, no. Just so that's how it resolves itself over time. If if they're all healthy and they're like, hey, you know, Mize is, is you know, ready to come off the IL and Manning's shoving and we don't – you know, we don't really want to go to a six man rotation. Then I think push cuz the shove Flaherty is so much better when his velo is over 94, 95. Like it's just, you just look at the splits and it's, he's so much better when he's, when he's got better velo that maybe you can convince him that it's time to be a guy who sits 96 in the pen and, and his next, you can even talk, sit down and talk to him and say, your next big deal is going to be as a closer. Speaking of closers, this is a team that has a very shaky situation. We've talked about Alex Lang. We could use you in the bullpen, probably. <laughs> they could just move someone else, and suddenly they've got a they got a new closer. But of the guys that are currently on the depth chart in the bullpen, we've talked about Shelby Miller being an interesting signing when they made it. I've liked Bo Brisky as someone that could be a lot more effective working in relief. He's got plenty of pitches. Stuff model likes him a bit. Those guys are more in the dark horse category. We previously sort of looked past Jason Foley. Jason Foley is pretty interesting because he's been closer to that ninth inning in the bullpen already. And I wonder if he's actually the biggest short term threat to wrestle away the job. Yeah, I mean, one of the flaws that we have with Alex Lang is he throws a sink- sinker, but he has like bottom shelf command of it. And so, you know, it seems like a tough thing to ask. Like, there are ways to throw right handed sinkers to lefties, there are ways. Uh, for for you to 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 mitigate that problem, one of them is like throw a high sinker, you know. But if you have really poor command of that sinker, then asking you to do anything other than sort of throw to the middle is is maybe asking too much. Jason Foley is also a sinker slider guy, but his command numbers are much better on the pitches. And so you know the 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 way the story goes is pretty easy. Six walks per nine. You know, Lang, that was last year for Lang. Uh, and I think Trevor was joking that he's seen Langy and Lange. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe Lange. Lange was the joke. <laughs> I, think, I think Lange was the joke. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm going to assume it's Lang. You, you, last year, you saw a really bad walk rate for Lang. All it takes is more of those walks turn into runs. That's all it takes for him to start being way shakier uh, as the closer. And Foley might be sitting there right there being like, hey, I'm not walking guys like that. Yeah, I think he was someone I had previously overlooked just a little bit in that pen. The big question with the Tigers, how much will they actually improve this year? Pakoda has 74.6 wins, third place in the AL Central. Too hot, too cold, or just right for the Tigers? Well, How much was that again? 74.6. Too cold. Let's go. Tigers ascendant. (laughs) I have slightly too cold, so I guess that means 77 or 78. The tick below 500 is where I have them right now. I, I do think it comes down to rotation health. I don't know if I trust that group to stay healthy. And I'm also not sure they're as good as they were supposed to be as prospects if they do stay healthy. That group specifically being Manning and Mize. Like those two guys just haven't quite been able to deliver what we expected of them. There's reasons to believe it comes more from that group of position players than the pitching depth. For me, and maybe the bullpen's a little underrated as a group. That could be one area where they're better than people realize. We are going to go on our way out the door. A few reminders theathletic.com slash rates and barrels gets you in the door for $2 a month for the first year. If you're a new subscriber, this is a great time to subscribe. The draft kit launched earlier this week. You can find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek and Ryber. You can find the pod at rates and barrels. Our live show in New York, two live shows on March 20th. 
and March 21st at Other Half Brewing in Williamsburg. So be sure to come check that out. With bells uh, on. Okay. Oh, you're trying to, I thought you were trying to get some, some graphics going again. Nah, we, maybe. If you, if you see random animations when we do thumbs up or if we wave on the on the video, we didn't actually know why that happened. Just It just happened. It was just magic. But uh, be sure to check us out live if you can do that. Drop us a nice rating and review wherever you listen to this podcast or be sure to hit the like button on this video if you're watching us on YouTube. The other announcement, of course, got our next live show coming up at 1 o'clock Eastern on Friday right here on our YouTube channel. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Friday. Thanks for listening.